good morning today's scripture reading will be from book of acts chapter 4 verses 23 to 31 chapter 4 verses 23 to 31 it reads as follows when they were released they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them and when they heard it they lifted their voices together to god and said sovereign lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father david your servant said by the holy spirit why did the gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the lord and against his anointed for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant jesus whom you anointed both herod and pontius pilate along with the gentiles and the peoples of israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place and now lord look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed to the name of your holy servant jesus and when they had prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the holy spirit and continued to speak the word of god with boldness thank you swaroop you know one of the great things about him is his last name starts with a d like mine thank you brother it's good to be back with you this morning I know you're getting updates from your committee. They're doing wonderful work. Continue to be in prayer for them uh, as they march forward, and you'll be hearing more about that in the near future. I'm loving your fall. I think I'm just going to stay for a month. So we'll be in Luke 18 this morning, Luke chapter 18. I think it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon that many years ago said, the great people of the earth today are the people who pray. Not the people who say they pray, or the people who say they believe in prayer, but the people who actually pray. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow, a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him, Day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Father, may this be more than an interesting story. May we be able to find a place 
behind the central figure of the story. To look over her shoulder. To see life through her eyes. To feel life the way she felt it. And to know something of not just her anxiousness, but her relentless pursuit of what she needed. That in some way parallels something of what we are to be in this world. as we cry out to you out of that same relentless pursuit of things that ultimately may matter in a world that is deaf to those things, that cares nothing for them. And to know that you do hear such cries. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Jim Cimbala, I don't know if that name means anything to you, Jim Cimbala, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Anybody familiar with that? Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, he wrote that book. It's a great read. A lot of people know about the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I mean, you've heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Okay, you look that up and Google that today, okay. But they played Carnegie Hall. You've heard of Carnegie Hall? pretty good place and you've got to be pretty good to get into Carnegie Hall but they've sold out Carnegie Hall I know two or three times interesting thing about the choir is that most of the people who came into that choir in the early days could not read music and so Jim Cimbala's wife uh, who can read music is a great musician singer she taught them how to sing and so you had relatively ungifted people but people with raw skills who could sing and she developed them into that choir and a lot of people know about the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir but they don't know the story about the Brooklyn Tabernacle itself. Years ago I think it was in the late 70s when Jim Zimbala went there he said yes to an invitation to leave where he was to go to this church that he knew very little about and he said not long after I got into this church I said to myself one day, oh my goodness, what have I done? He said it was surrounded by urban decay. The church was completely and utterly depressed. And he said, that's putting it mildly. And he said, I thought, what am I going to do in this situation? And he said, one day while I was teaching a class, he said, we got down toward the end. And I said, does anyone have anything to say before we leave and a lady raised her hand and said may I ask a question he said certainly she said would it be possible for us sometime to just come together and pray and he said well we we do come together and pray she said no I mean just just to pray not for class not to read the Bible could we come together just to pray And he said, I must confess, he said, I had really domesticated prayer at that point in my life. And I was not at all on the same wavelength with this woman. He said, so the following Tuesday, we came together. And he said, we prayed. And he said, I didn't know what to expect. And so he said, we allowed people just to pray. And he said, for the next 45 minutes, he said, I heard people say things in prayer that I had never heard people say in prayer. I heard people talk to God in ways that I'd never heard them talk to God. He said, and it went so well, we decided to do it the next Tuesday and then the next Tuesday. Several months later, it was not uncommon for two to three thousand people to come to the Brooklyn Tabernacle just to what? Pray. And he said, I would move through the Brooklyn Tabernacle. He said, I would go off into corners. He said, I'd get in the back. He said, I'd go all over the church house, even outside. People would be in cars. And he said, I heard people agonize in prayer. I heard people use words that I'd never used in prayer. I heard people say things to God that were visceral, guttural, emotional. 
that I'd never heard anybody say to God, including myself. And he said, through that experience, I learned to talk to God. He said, I didn't learn it in theology class. I didn't learn it from a professor, all respect, notwithstanding. He said, but I learned it from people who didn't graduate high school, people who worked two and three jobs, single moms, dads, teenagers who were coming in off the street. He said, I learned who God was and how to talk to God as I listened to this church pray. And he said, of all the things we did at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, the ministries that we put together, the preaching, all of the various things that we did, the thing that brought renewal to the Brooklyn Tabernacle was prayer. In Luke 17, Luke is retelling a story for an audience that was not present when it was first told. But they're at a place in their lives in which they need something in place, they need to be anchored, if you will, in place regarding prayer. Because as they look out at their world, the ground is shifting. Jerusalem has been destroyed or is about to be destroyed. They feel political pressure. There's angst in the air. There's persecution. Some of the house churches are under pressure. The house churches are smaller than they were in their infancy. And people are beginning to ask some very existential questions about God and about faith and future. And are we on a wild goose chase? And when all of those things crowd in around you in the first century, 69, 70, 71, 72 AD, or 2022, in the mix of all that, we can become intellectual in our faith. And a ceiling gets erected over us. And God becomes an intellectual figure. But He's not a living presence. He's not active. He's not involved. He's not at work in the world of humanity. He's not involved in human space. He becomes locked in worship services and in the box, as I call it. And so we study and we get a word and we put it and we wrap it and we go on about our ways. And Luke knows his people are in that place. So Luke revisits this story in Luke 18. It's one of 24 parables in Luke. Luke is fond of parables. And Jesus would snatch story frameworks from everyday life. Agriculture, wheat, leaven, a wedding, a banquet, water, a farmer. Stuff that's not complicated that was everyday life. He would take that piece of everyday life and he would insert a spiritual truth into that story. In Luke 18, he tells a story, but it's different than the other stories that he tells. In his composition, number one, but number two, if I were to tell John up in the booth a joke, and I were to say, John, I'm going to tell you a joke. Now, before I tell you the joke, the punchline is X. John would say, you're not from around here, Randy. Because when we tell jokes here, we never tell what first? We never tell the punchline first. You must be from Texas. <laughs> but Jesus tells the punchline first, and then he tells the story. And he says, I'm just going to tell you, first crack out of the box, this story is about not losing heart when you pray or in the experience of prayer. And he grabs somebody from everyday life that everybody would associate with. He grabs a widow. In that day and age, it was a man's world. Second came women and children. And after that, widows. And if you lost your guy in the first century, you didn't have a check coming. There was no social service to go see. There was nobody to call. You were literally, terrifyingly on your own. And you had to figure out how to make a living. And so Jesus grabs this person, very vulnerable, desperate person who has a grievance 
And she goes to this judge who is more concerned about his golf game than he is about her grievance. And I don't know if it was about creditors. I don't know if somebody had stiffed her on a payment, if somebody had not done something for her, if there was somebody who was trying to press her uh, financially, if there was some kind of a business deal. I don't know what it was, but she needed legal help. And so she goes to the one place, she goes to the court. She doesn't have an intermediary. She does not have, if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. She has to go to this judge solo and just plead it out. And he looks down his docket and he says, you know what, I've got a lot of people here to talk to and you just quite, you're just not important enough. And so what do you do? You go home, you bury your hand in your, in your, in your, your face in your hand, you say, well, it's over. So what does this woman do? She bothers him. When's the last time you were bothered? How many has got kids? Daddy, mama. And so this guy leaves the bench. He goes home. He stops by the supermarket, and she's in aisle 13. He said, hey, you, you remember me? Oh, how could I forget? I just wanted to know if, I, if you've got me on the docket. I, yeah, I'm working on that. And another day or two pass, and he's down at the gas station. He says, oh, hey, do you, you remember me? I just wanted to, how's that docket thing coming? I'm, I'm where, yes, ma'am, I'm working on that. And after about 15 of those, he said, boy, I have got to do something about this woman. And so he gives her legal remedy. And Jesus takes this story and he flips it. And he asks the question, he says, when the Son of Man comes. Now think of all the questions he could have asked about being church. When the Son of Man comes, will they be gathering decently and in order? When the Son of Man comes, will they practice baptism? It's important. When the Son of Man comes, will they have the bread and the wine in the right order? When the Son of Man comes, you fill in the blank. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, wait a minute. Jesus has short-term memory issues. I thought this parable started with prayer. It did, didn't it? But when Jesus finishes this parable, he asks the question, he says, prayer is equated with what? Faith. So deductively, he would say, people of faith are people who pray. Jesus doesn't intellectualize faith. He didn't put faith in a box. He didn't put faith even in the Bible. He says people of faith are people who pray. There is just something about us as human beings. We get it as kids, and it carries over into the adult years. That we need something to look forward to. We do. If you take away something to look forward to, life becomes a little drab, doesn't it? And as we look at the calendar and we get through winter and we get, you know, that's the next season. You're aware of that in Virginia, right? Mm, uh. And then we get into spring and people start thinking about summer vacation. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Who are we going to do it with? I remember as a kid when we would start thinking about what we're going to do in the summer my dad used to say, he said, this is one of the funnest times of my life and one of the most painful. He says, because you and your sister, when, when, when? When are we going, Daddy? We need something to look forward to. And when we don't have something to look forward to, life doesn't just get boring and routine, but it can do things to us. And I wonder, by the same token... If sometimes when we think about prayer, the same thing applies. Then when you bring up the subject of prayer, it doesn't electrify us. It doesn't excite us. It doesn't have a wow factor. Because deep down inside of us, 
we're not real sure that prayer goes past the ceiling. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus. Time marches on. There used to be the horse and the buggy cooking over a wood-burning stove. Now we've got nanotechnology, jet travel, combustion, interchangeable parts, Mickey Mouse. And maybe we're just alone in the world. Maybe the deists have it right. It's wound up like a big clock. We're alone in the world. It's just us and a Bible and church in the box and waiting on God to show back up. And in the meantime, there are these prayer texts sprinkled in Scripture. Has your prayer ever felt reduced before you ever started? Have you ever walked into prayer thinking of it as a civilized event? Have you ever gone into prayer thinking about, I hope I get the words right? Have you ever gone into prayer with your list? Check, 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 check. In Jesus' name. Oh, and don't forget, God garden what? That's right. In Jesus' name, amen. And it can become a rote thing. It's generic. We pray for easy things. Cute things. sometimes lesser things. But in this parable, Jesus sees believers, everybody, in a priestly role. We are priests between the heavenly and the world, between the heavenly and human experience, between the heavenly and what goes on on the planet. And when you're in a priestly role, which comes with our baptism. That's not an easy place to live in. John Mott said, The church has not yet touched the fringe of the possibilities of intercessory prayer. Her largest victories will be witnessed when individual Christians everywhere come to recognize their priesthood unto God and day by day give thanks and give themselves unto prayer. And when we step into the consciousness of evil, when I'm awake to evil, how many are aware that it is in our earth? It wasn't, it wasn't back then. It's still here. When we're awake to the brokenness in our world and the ravages of injustice and pain, Occupying that space, that priestly space, takes us into the habit and the discipline and experience of prayer that is way beyond anything civilized. It puts us in that special space between what God is up to in the heavenlies and thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And a large part of that bringing is not just learning Scripture and putting words on a digital board. That's good. But it's living in that priestly role where we call out to God about truth and righteousness and good news and evicting evil. And we actually do get up every day thinking, as Paul said, Maranatha, Lord, O Lord, come. People look at me a little cross-eyed sometimes. They say, what would make today great? I said, if Jesus returned and entered the new kingdom with us. There's nothing better than that.
When we give up on prayer, this kind of prayer, it's not just that we're nibbling around the edges of prayer's experience. We're actually making a declaration about God. I'm telling Joseph, when I pray, how I pray, what I pray, I'm telling him what I think about God. If I were to talk about going to the local grocery store, and Joseph said, tell me about your experience, and I said, I always go get bread and butter. He said, man, how big is your store? I said, sometimes I pick up jelly. When I go shop, I get bread and butter and jelly. Now, how many can live on that forever? I think I know a teenager who can in pizza pockets, but other than that. But he might say, have you walked any of the aisles? Have you actually been into the store other than the bread aisle? Have you, been, have you seen the cheese and the meats and all? There's a much greater experience there. I said, yeah, but... All I really need is bread and butter. He might ask me, yeah, but when's the last time you shopped for somebody else? Now that's different. And when we're in that priestly role, when we're praying, we're saying something powerful about God. We're speaking truth to the world about who God not was, but who God is, who He still is. In regards to what's coming across the ticker tape or what's coming through the media or what new advancement in technology is about to pop, none of that is front page news other than the fact that the living God is afoot in His world. I want you to think about this. Look at the screen. Richard Foster said, Our prayer to the extent that it is fully authentic undermines the status quo. It is a spiritual underground resistance movement. I like that. We are subversives in a world of injustice, oppression, and violence. The weapons of our resistance make us appear to be completely irrelevant to a world based on power, efficiency, and control. We speak truth. We pray for our enemies. We refuse to cooperate with injustice. And yet, incredible as it may seem, these weapons are powerful in pulling down strongholds and bringing to birth the righteousness and peaceable kingdom of Jesus. One of the most disheartening conversations I've had over the last year and a half has been with Christians. I've sat in coffee shops and over lunches and back porches and I try to stay off social media because I want to be sane. And they're talking about all the things that are going on in just our country. You know the list. In 90% of those conversations, people are posturing or positioning themselves intellectually or politically about how to fix And when you ask them, how do you word this to the living sovereign Lord? Well, you mean pray? Yeah. Well, well, how do do you put this in prayer? I I don't know. Which is a dead giveaway. We try to flex things into place. In a world where God is trying to bring His kingdom to bear in that same place, but He does it as we cry out to Him and wait on Him and trust Him to do that, and all God's people said. But that takes us out of control and puts Him there. When we're engaged in intercessory prayer, which is what this is, We are saying things to each other about how we see our partnership with God. Prayer is not a tack on, it's a partnership. We do it with each other and we do it with Him. And we're actually saying to each other, 
that I still believe that in this world, as crazy complex as it looks, with all of its bravado and the sense that it's going to go forever, and we're in charge of manifest destiny, that we still believe that God is in the middle of that and can remove strongholds of evil and bring His reign to bear in human existence. The way I think we're going to know that from each other is not just in how well we can excavate Scripture. but to the extent that we can hear it from each other. That our hearts can be open and we can say things to each other about the world and about God, lament and praise. And when we get done, know that it was heard. Years ago, there were two little boys playing down by the Mississippi River. One of the little boys had made a little makeshift raft. He yelled out to his friend and said, Hey, Frank, come on down. He said, What are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm going to take my raft out. Mighty Mississippi. Well, they jumped on this little makeshift raft, got out into Mississippi. Mississippi's got currents, got some riptides. The little raft started to come apart just about the time they got to a sandbar floated up on the sandbar with their lives. The Mississippi tore their raft up. They're stranded. The little boy that built the raft, he said, what are we going to do? He said, we're in the middle of the Mississippi. So nobody's going to find us. And here came a riverboat. The other little boy got up and He said, man, a boat's not going to pay attention to us. The big river boat. He said, that one will. He said, why? He said, just hang on a minute. The director of the river boat began to change course and come toward the sandbar. And he said, why is that river boat coming this way? He said, because my daddy's the captain. My daddy's the captain. We may feel like we're in the middle of a sandbar sometimes. But brothers and sisters, the most powerful people on planet Earth are people who cry out in a priestly role to the living God daily about human experience. There is none greater in all God's people's sake. We're going to stand and sing to our God right now. And if you need to come, you're here this morning, you need to come for prayer from this body. One of the reasons we gather is to do this. Go ahead and stand. Is do ministry to each other and for each other. If you want to have a conversation about Scripture, about God, Jesus, Gospel, we love to do that in this place. You will find many conversation partners here. We are glad you're here. Let's sing to our God.